We're going to be in Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. How many of you have ever been treated by a physical therapist? We've got some that are still going. Um, my older sister is a licensed physical therapist. She doesn't practice anymore. She has some medical issues of her own that kind of keep her from being able to be active in doing that. But uh, my first big boy job was to work as an aide in the physical therapy department at Methodist Hospital in Dallas. And my whole job was to get people from their room to the physical therapy lab and then back from the physical therapy lab to their room and occasionally help uh, in the therapy itself. Uh, it's, a, it's an amazing thing to watch someone come into the lab who is barely functional and to see the end result when they're through with their therapy, so much gain that they've had. Uh, it's actually a fairly new science. It's only maybe 50 years that doctors have been trusting physical therapists to do what they do, but it's amazing how far they can take somebody. Um, usually after surgery or after an injury to maybe help reteach the muscles and the ligaments how to do what they've done naturally for years. Uh, it's a weird feeling when all of a sudden your body doesn't do what your body has always been able to do. And you have to kind of relearn how to do it. There's a couple of things that physical therapists cannot do. Uh, they cannot help someone who refuses treatment. If you don't let the physical therapist help you, then you probably remain as you are or things deteriorate from where they are. I have a very good friend, in fact, this last week we got to spend a couple of days with Kelly. Uh, love him dearly, but he's a man. And he was up on a scaffold uh, hanging an air conditioner unit in a building, and they had that metal strapping holding it up. He lost his balance and he grabbed for something to keep him from falling off the scaffold and he got the metal strapping, just ripped these two <clears throat> little fingers. And so they curl like this. They gave him physical therapy to do. He didn't do it. So the other night uh, we were going to take a group, pic a group picture and his girlfriend handed him the phone and he was on this end and he's trying to figure out which fingers he could use to try to make a selfie. And finally he just gave up. He said, huh? I can't do it with my fingers this way. Well, the reason he can't do it with his fingers that way is that he didn't do the treatment that the physical therapist gave him to do. The other thing that a physical therapist cannot do, uh, they cannot undo rigor mortis. If you're dead, it doesn't help. Okay? Just hold on to that because that's the important point. I know it's kind of a silly point, but when you die, the blood stops flowing and the tendons and ligaments all tighten up and there's nothing you can do about that. You can't take a dead body and give it physical therapy and make it work again. In Galatians chapter 3, Paul outlines three reasons why trying to revive the old law, trying to gain salvation through works of the flesh, will never work. You can't take something old, the old law, and revive it, and give it some PT, and get it working again so that it will be useful to you in your walk with Christ. It's interesting to us to study the old law. It's important for us to understand what God expects from us, but we will never be able to concoct, revive, uh, therapy a system that is about what we do to gain our salvation. Let's start verses 1 through 5. Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain, if it really was in vain? So again, I ask, does God give you his Spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by your believing what you heard. So also Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. So Paul says, 
I've got one question I want to ask you that he asks three questions. Uh, how are you given God's spirit? How were you given God's spirit? Were you given God's spirit because you were so good that one day you were walking along the road doing good things and God came down to you and said, you know what? You're a good somebody. I think I'll give you my spirit. No. You were baptized into Christ. You put on Christ. And at that point, you were given the Holy Spirit as a gift. Not as something you earned, not as something you went out and did well enough to deserve. Paul says, how did you receive God's spirit? Was it by the works of the law or by, was it by faith? And then he says, can you finish what God has started? Now that you've been given the spirit, are you somehow going to keep the spirit and keep being saved by something that you're able to do? Are you going to be good enough long enough now that at the end of your life, God will say, well, I realized that I had to help you along with the Spirit, but you're so good, you deserve to come in. Kind of that Peter at the Golden Gate scenario where Peter's standing there with his book, and I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I see here that, you know, you did 56 and a 55, and you never said, I'm sorry. So, I'm sorry. I just can't let you in. And you may think that that's a ridiculous example, but I was once in the presence of someone who asked me the question, if I'm in a car and I'm driving 57 and a 55 and I'm not wearing my seatbelt and I die, do I go to hell because I was breaking the law and I didn't say I'm sorry before I passed? What a horrible understanding of God's grace. What a terrible way to have to live your life. Paul says, by having been saved by grace, having the Spirit given to you, are you now going to perfect yourself? By means of the law, are you going to do well enough, long enough, so that God will save you? And then he talks about their situation. What about those miracles? Are you just that good person? That God says, look at that good person. I think I'll do some miracles through them. Some of the folks who did miracles in the New Testament include guys who were really rough, uh, probably difficult to get along with fishermen. I'm thinking of James and John. Peter did miracles, did lots and lots of miracles. But Peter was just, you know, he, he, he was barely blue collar, right? Uh, Peter was a redneck. Wow. Peter went fishing for a living. Peter was not uh, anybody important. And they, no one would have looked at Peter and said, look at all the good Peter's doing. Maybe God can use him. The apostle Matthew at the seat of custom, taking people's taxes do you think anybody ever came by and said, oh, thank you, Matthew, for taking my taxes. You're such a good guy. God could use you to do miraculous things. No. They trusted in Jesus. And because of their trust in Jesus, they were given the ability to do amazing things. And Paul says, well, you Galatians, did you get that ability because you were so good? You kept the law so well? In fact, a lot of these Galatians had never known the law. They'd never seen the law. They couldn't possibly have been good enough at keeping the law because they were Gentiles. It was never part of their life before they came to Christ. So the answer to all those questions ought to be obvious enough. If God has given you the Spirit because of the law, then you're going to have to keep the law to keep the Spirit. But if the law was not the reason you received the Spirit, then you're not going to keep the Spirit by keeping the law. The Spirit is separate from that. It is part of your existence, part of your life, because God gave it to you. Now, please allow me to give you a terrible illustration. I hope some of you have played basketball. I tried on occasion. I'm 5'7". Uh, I once had a guy, we were sitting in a quartet together at uh, Harding University, and he said, let's go play basketball. So we went down to the gym at Harding, and every time I tried to shoot, he would slap the ball away and laugh at me. And I was there for about 15 minutes, so I finally gave up and said, Scott, I'm just not going to play with you anymore because you're not, very, you're not very nice if you won't let me shoot. But when you play in groups, like four or five people, uh, just pick up games, there's a couple of things that you want to do. You want to try to get the best guys on your team, obviously, if you're choosing up teams. And then you want to play make it, take it. And by make it, take it, I mean that if you have the ball and you make the shot, then your team gets the ball back. Right? So you get to bring it out again. 
you get to try to score again. So if it's a game to 10, your team could possibly just score 10 points in a row and the other team never even touched the ball. I've been in games like that where the other team scored 10 points in a row and uh, we never even got to be on offense. And then the other thing you do is what's called do or die. Raise your hand if you know what do or die is. Do or die is. Is that just for my neighborhood? Beth raised her hand, so it must just be a Texas or, or, or Oklahoma thing. The do or die was you needed to find out who, which team was going to get the ball first. And so you chuck the ball at the guy from the other team, and you'd say, what do y'all shoot the do or die? And you had to shoot it usually from behind the three-point line, which meant I never shot it. And you, you, if you made it, then your team got the ball. So keep all of that going. I told you it wasn't a great illustration, but follow me. We're going somewhere. So we've got all of this to say this. If you've got four guys on your team, let's say you've got an NBA guy on your team. You've got a college NCAA Division I guy on your team. You've got a high school All-American on your team. You've got me on your team, and you've got a dead guy on your team. Okay? Now, out of all of those, who do you want to shoot the do or die? Right? If the NBA guy says, no, I don't want to do it, and the NBA and the uh, college guy says, I don't want to do it, the high school guy says, I don't want to do it, and it's all the way down to either me or the dead guy. <laughs> At least I'm better than the dead guy. Paul is trying to tell the Galatians that what you're trying to do is give PT to the dead guy and let him shoot the do or die. If you're, you're basing all of your hopes, all of your dreams, all of your victory possibilities on the dead guy. Let the dead guy go. You don't need him. God's doing things in you that are living and active and amazing. You don't need the law. You don't need the dead guy. But somehow the church... This sounds too familiar. Had decided that having been made alive by the Spirit, they were now going to adopt the law. And so Paul had to write them this letter to warn them of what they were getting into. Let me ask you a couple of questions. Are you saved because of your obedience and your ability to keep the truth well? Are you going to go to heaven in the end because you did a good enough job of doing what you know God wants you to do? If in your heart of hearts you're saying yes, Paul would say to you, let the dead guy go. Allow God to give you his saving grace and give you salvation that you cannot earn, that you cannot ascertain, you cannot understand on your own. We may do things for God because we are saved, but we will never be saved because we do things for God. There's only one way for us to be saved. I am the way and the truth and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. You might recognize that from our Savior. And now that God has given you life, now that you are saved because of his grace. Can you take over and finish what he started? Is God not good enough? Is his grace not sufficient enough that you need to do something to make yourself worthy of salvation? Just some things to think about. Second point. Let's go down to uh, verse 6. Verse 6. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are the children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announced the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, as it is written. Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. So this promise is made to God, or made by God, uh, long before Moses was ever born. Long before Moses ever goes to Mount Sinai. Long before we go get the children of Israel 
out of Egypt and take them to Mount Sinai. And God gives the law to Moses on Sinai. He's already promised Abraham what's going to happen. He's already said that through Abraham, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Not through the law. Not through uh, the moral law. Not through the, um, the church law of the Jews. But through the faith of Abraham. Through the one that came through his lineage. Paul points out that the promise was made 430 years before the law. So the law cannot undo the promise. What was the law meant for? Why was it there? It was meant to keep the Jews in line. It was meant to keep the Jews together as a nation. It was meant to keep them connected to God until that one, that seed of Abraham could be born. And through that seed, all the nations of the earth could be blessed. Now, we're talking about people in other cultures who live in ways that you and I would detest. They live in houses that we wouldn't live in. They have customs we couldn't stand, we wouldn't tolerate. I uh, watched a, a movie one time about aborigines eating earthworms and just thought that was the most bizarre thing I had ever seen, right? I like mine on, not my earthworms, I like my food on a plate, warmed well, right? Fix me some good old Southern American fried chicken, mashed potatoes, because that's what real people eat. Those people are just as saved as I am. There are people that go from place to place on foot all the time. I have a couple of guys that I keep up with in Kenya, don't have any mode of transportation unless they pay for public transportation, which doesn't come to their house. They have to hike for miles to get to a place where there's a vehicle to take them somewhere else. I wouldn't put up with that. If it was a terrible car, it would be better than nothing because I'm spoiled, because I've lived in my culture all my life. There are things that we do that we hold as sacred that they've never heard of. Go ahead and pause with the old law. The Galatians had never heard of some of that stuff that the Jews did. They ate foods that the Jews would never consider putting in their mouth. It was unclean, it was wrong. But there were Christians in Jerusalem who thought that the Christians in Galatia either had to be just like them and keep the laws they kept, or they couldn't be saved. How did the promise come to Abraham? We don't know all the details. But we know that while he was living in Ur, that God came to him. And he said, Abram, I want you to leave your home, and I want you to leave your family. And I want you to go with me, and I'll show you where I want you to go. Well, where God wanted him to go was the promised land. It's the same with us. Through the scripture, through other people who uh, are intermediates for us, who come and give us the message, we learn the word of God, and basically God is saying to us, leave everything else behind. The only thing that's really important is where I'm taking you. And if we say yes, Lord, I want to go, then there's things we got to do along the way, right? We follow his direction. We go where he takes us to go. But we don't earn the promised land. We don't somehow come into a place where we can say to God, look, I've done everything you told me to do. Therefore, the promised land is mine. Sometimes we're frustrated. God told Abraham, I'm going to give you a son of your own. You and Sarah are going to have a son. You know how long it took? 25 years. Waited until Sarah was 89 years old. Abraham was 99 years old. So Isaac's finally born when he's 100. It's hard to hang on to something like that. It's hard to keep saying, yes, Lord, yes, I will. But Abraham <laughs> believed God. What made Abraham righteous? What he did or what he believed? He trusted God and God gave him the things that he promised to do. Um, I wrote down in my notes, God never signed on the dotted line. Right? We like contracts. We like it when people sign. If you have time, the closest thing to God signing on the dotted line is Genesis 15. Don't do it now. Put that phone down. Read it later. Genesis 15 tells about 
God making this contract with Abraham because of Abraham's faith. Abraham does nothing, basically. God does it all. And then finally, it's not about bondage. It's about freedom. It's about being set free to live a life of obedience in our life with Christ. So let's start back in verse 11. Paul says, clearly no one who relies on the law is justified before God because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says the person who does these things will make a lifestyle by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Jesus Christ so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Brothers and sisters, let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that's been duly established, so it is in this case. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. What I mean is this. The law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on the promise. But God in his grace gave it to Abraham through promise. Uh, Paul likes to do these play on words. If it's not of, or if it's of works, it's no longer of grace. Otherwise, works is no more works. But if it's of grace, it's no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. In other words, you have to separate. You're either saved by grace or you're saved by works. Which one is it? Here he says you're either saved by works or you're saved by the promise. Which one is it? God did not save Abraham or give Abraham these gifts by his works. He gave them. By promise, he did not bring Jesus by the works of the Jewish people. Imagine that. Think about where the Jewish people were and how horrible they were to God for all of those years. And yet God still brings through the Jewish people his Savior just like he said he would. What did the Jews do to earn Jesus coming through Mary in Bethlehem of Judea, growing up in Nazareth, teaching in Jerusalem, what did they ever do to bring that about? Nothing. God said he would do it, and he did it. And there were so many people who didn't even trust him. But God had made a promise, and God kept his promise. There's two curses in this passage. The first one is carry, calling down a curse upon yourself that you would go back to trying to save yourself through the works of the law. And the other one is Jesus, who was cursed because he was hung on a tree. Our sacrifice, carrying our sins, and none of his own. Do you want to be free? We're going to keep preaching through Galatians. And I, I, would, I would love for you to just take every opportunity to be here each Sunday morning to listen to the things that Paul told these Galatians. I've spoken with several of you, and not just here, but folks that that we've visited for years in the church, and members of the church struggle, struggle with the idea that somehow they're going to have to do something right sooner or later that will get them to heaven. They've got a list, right? and depending on which congregation you're worshiping with, the list may include or exclude some things. There are some of our brethren that don't think that we're saved. You understand that, right? There's some folks that worship in a building that says the Church of Christ meets here and they don't think that we're saved because we're not doing things the way they do things. There are some of us that look at other members in other churches of Christ and we say, well, they're not saved because they're not doing things the way we do things. And the problem with all of that is the repeated phrase doing things. Are we saved because we're doing things? Or are we saved because Jesus died on the cross and his blood has forgiven us from our sins? 
It's either by grace or it's by works. Now, I realize we're talking about the old law, and it's a particular document, it's a particular thing. But the, the idea remains, are you going to keep a certain group of regulations well enough, long enough, Forget that you have to figure out which is the right list, but then are you going to keep the right list long enough that God's going to say, congratulations, you found the right list, you kept it well enough, now come into glory? Or do we hope that because God promised through his son that all the nations of the earth would be blessed, that we can be blessed through his blood, through his sacrifice, through his being cursed on the tree and enter heaven because of his righteousness and not because of ours. Is it worth wrestling with? I think it is. There's more to come. I want you to come back and share this study with me. Uh, it's, it's a challenge to present it, and I know it's a challenge to accept it and to <coughs> put it into work in our lives. So let's do that together. I, I promise to show up. <laughs>